So um, everyone here at Horizon House, welcome um, Taha Ibrahimi. Um, I <clears throat> became aware of her through my um, good committee members, uh, Laura Weiss and Nancy Olson, who pointed out that the um, Historical Society was having her as a featured speaker. And um, it was a good program um, where um, Taha, who um, grew up, who was born and raised here in Seattle and um, has been a reporter and now works in marketing for a software firm. She was telling me just briefly as we introduced each other that she has really benefited from having some time off from COVID to, to pursue a few passions. And one of those passions was to learn more about this house on Capitol Hill that um, where Horace Roscoe, Roscoe Clayton and Susie Reynolds Clayton lived. Um, they were a prominent African-American family in Seattle in the early 20th century. And their story, I think it will be interesting to us because it's um, a story about a, a couple and a house in our neighborhood, so to speak, up by Volunteer Park. But also it helps us understand how did we go from having a couple that was um, really well known and well received and then things changed in Seattle. So it's interesting to hear um, something about the history. A lot of us have been puzzled. When did it happen that suddenly we got redlining and so much segregation? And this couple gives us a learning about this couple gives us a little insight into that. So Taha, thank you so much for be, uh, being willing to come and share with us uh, tonight. And um, thank you for all the work that you did on behalf of um, making sure that this got on the historic register. So thank you so much. That's such a sweet introduction. Um, and it is true, uh, COVID, I would say the pandemic allowed me to even pursue this project. I, I'm a director at a software company. They don't give me a single minute to even like prepare my food for the day. So during the COVID um, pandemic, I suddenly had all this time where I wasn't, uh, you know, uh, having some of these pointless meetings that we would normally have. And I, I got to really do a deep dive into the things I was interested in. And, um, and it was really interesting where, where things went. So for those who just joined, what you're seeing on screen right now is a photograph from just this past winter of the Caton Revels house. And it's located on 14th Avenue East um, between Mercer and Republican Streets. That little inset map there with the arrow points at it. It's about three blocks south of Volunteer Park. And... Here it is in 1909. This was over 110 years ago. It's almost the same. And from 1902, when it was built, until the year this photo was taken, Horace R. Caton and his wife, Susie Sumner Revels Caton, lived here. And together they ran Seattle's second most read newspaper. And the name of that newspaper was the Seattle Republican. And they were just one of a few Black American families who were living in the Capitol Hill neighborhood in that period. And if, um, you know, if you think about it, Capitol Hill was a very new neighborhood at that time. There, this was considered the suburbs. Because of their business and political involvements, the Catons were one of the most well-known Black American families in Seattle at the turn of the 20th century. And here we have a photo of Horace and Susie, and this was taken around 1896, which was the year that they got married. Their newspaper, the Seattle Republican, ran from 1894 to 1913. And incidentally, there were seven Black weekly newspapers in Seattle between 1891 to 1901. The Seattle Republican was the only one to last into the 20th century, but it was part of a kind of zeitgeist that was happening here in Seattle. And I should also mention that Susie Caton, who was the associate editor of the Seattle Republican, is also probably the first female editor in Seattle. 
um, I did a little bit of research and the next time a woman would be documented as being an editor of one of the most read newspapers in Seattle wouldn't be until 1940. It's just that Susie didn't get credit for it. So Horace Caton was born enslaved on a Mississippi cotton plantation in Claiborne County in 1859. And after the Civil War, his father was one of the lucky ones who got a piece of land to farm. And this is how they were able to afford to send Horace to Alcorn College, which still exists today. And he eventually left the Deep South and arrived in Seattle in 1890. And that was one year after the Great Seattle Fire. And it was also the same year that Jim Crow laws were passed in Claiborne County where he came from. Here, Horace is quoted um, talking about why he moved to the Pacific Northwest. And he said, when I first came out to this territory, a man was as good as his word. I went out in man-to-man -man competition and was successful. I had high hopes it would continue that way. I believed in the country. So Horace Caton eventually leased Seattle's first black owned newspaper, and that was called the Seattle Standard. But he got in a dispute with the owner who thought he was being too radical. And that's when Horace decided to start his own newspaper in 1894, Seattle's second black owned newspaper. And that was the Seattle Republican. And this quote um, kind of encapsulated his editorial policy. And that was, the only plausible and certain manner of forever settling race or national issues is by fully and freely discussing them. This is Susie Sumner Revels Caton, circa 1909. So she would have been about 39 when this photo was taken. She graduated from Rust University just a few years after the celebrated Black American journalist Ida B. Wells. Susie was the daughter of Hiram Rhodes Revels, pictured here, and Hiram Rhodes Revels was the first Black American to be elected a U.S. Senator. Quite remarkable, um, considering that just a couple of months ago, we got our fourth Black American Senator from a Southern state that was elected. He was a Democrat. Senator Hiram Rhodes Revels was um, was a Republican at the time. If you remember, the, um, the parties were a little bit swapped back then. He represented Mississippi in 1870. And get this, the reason he was given a seat was because Jefferson Davis, who went on to become the president of the Confederacy, abandoned his seat. And that's how Hiram Rhodes Rebels got his seat. So he literally sat in the seat of uh, the president of the Confederacy. You can't make this stuff up. Revels would become the president of Alcorn College where Horace graduated from. And after Susie graduated, she started to get very interested in a newspaper that one of her father's old students was publishing out in this far flung place called Seattle. And of course the editor of that newspaper was Horace Caton. And he became the first person to publish Susie's writing. She soon moved out to Seattle and they got married. And in 1900, she became the newspaper's associate editor. And as I mentioned before, it wouldn't be until 1940 when another woman, whether black or white, would become editor of one of the most read newspapers in Seattle. So at its peak, the Seattle Republican had an estimated 10,000 mostly white readers across Washington. It was distributed each Saturday for five cents a copy and subscriptions were $2 a year. Both black and white businesses advertised in its pages, including Dexter Horton Bank, which was Seattle's first bank, Bonnie and Stewart Undertakers, which was Seattle's first funeral home, and Seattle Gas and Electric Company. All the major businesses in Seattle would advertise in this paper. And the paper itself focused on local politics, community happenings, and issues of equality and civil rights. So because of the newspaper, the Catons were the most politically influential Black Americans in Seattle at that time. In 1907, Susie was the founding president of the Dorcas Society, 
which was ultimately responsible for establishing a policy at the newly created Seattle Children's Hospital to accept any sick child, regardless of race, religion, or parents' ability to pay. That's her legacy, which is quite amazing. And here in 1908, you can see Horace Caton at the Republican Central Committee for Washington State. The two men at the table are Ellis de Bruyler on the left, he's the chairman, and J. Will Lysons on the right, who's the secretary. And both white and black people considered Horace Caton a respected business leader in Seattle. And I wanted to show you this newspaper clipping, which is a notice about a meeting that is being called by um, the former mayor, Robert Moran. And here it says um, that this meeting consists of the best known business and professional men of the city. And of course you see vaunted names in here like Fry, you see McGilvra, you see Horton, you see Stimson, and you see H.R. Caton. The success of the Seattle Republican allowed the Catons to move to the new affluent suburb of Capitol Hill. They were even able to hire a servant, a 20-year-old Japanese man named Nish. And here, the family is pictured on the front porch of their Capitol Hill home around 1904. And going kind of from left to right, standing here with the glasses is Emma, that's Susie's niece. And she's standing. Susie is sitting here with the baby in her hand and the baby is Horace Jr. And Horace, sorry, uh, uh, Horace Caton himself, senior, is standing here with the glasses above Madge, who is seated, and that Madge is their second daughter. Their eldest daughter, Ruth, is in the front, and she's kind of blurred out there. This is the exact same house, and it really hasn't changed much. They were standing right there on that porch that you see, right there in front of that same window. And this house has only ever had three owners since it was built, kind of a time capsule. In fact, the current owners had no idea about the house's history until they happened to find the first black US senators receipts in the attic floorboards. So here is an image of the receipt they found and it's a running tab that began in 1899 for a store called R. Schumacher Dealers of Dry Goods, Clothing, Boots, and Plantation Supplies. And this is not a Seattle store. This is a store from down south where, um, where he lived. And at the bottom, you can see it says paid. And you can see it, that is marked in 1900. And at the top, it's signed by the Reverend Hiram Rhodes Rebels. And when Susie's father passed away, Horace traveled to Mississippi and brought back his father-in-law's belongings, which is probably when these artifacts got lost in the attic. He probably put a box up there. And another interesting note is that Hiram Rhodes Revels, before he passed away, he was planning on moving up to Seattle. So we very nearly missed the occasion of having the first Black American U.S. Senator pass away in Seattle, which would have kind of changed the course of history and how we tell that narrative today. So um, back into the geography of this. The Kate and Revels house is located on Capitol Hill, um, specifically in an eight block area that was known as the Highlands Edition. So that's the eight block area that I've highlighted here. And that yellow um, house there is supposed to indicate um, the Kate and Revels house. Um, the Highlands Edition was filed in 1889 by the Broadway Investment Company. And the president of the Broadway Investment Company was E.P. Ferry, who was the first governor of Washington. The house um, here was right on 14th Avenue East, which led right up to the park, which is what that blue line there on the inset map shows. So um, it went right up to the entrance. And as you can see, it was about three blocks south of the park. And originally, Capitol Hill was known as Broadway Hill and it was just kind of a wagon road that led to a cemetery that is today Lakeview Cemetery, but that's all Capitol Hill really was uh, originally. Then in 1901, 
the developer James A. Moore, who also built the Moore Theater in Belltown, bought the land to the north of the Highlands addition. Um, sorry, uh, I need to figure out my, I, I was going in such a flow that I almost had the, the technology figured out, but I didn't. Um, okay, sorry, there we go. That is the original plot there that James A. Moore bought north of the Highlands edition above Roy Street. And he rebranded this area as Capitol Hill. And in 1901 is when Broadway Hill started becoming known as Capitol Hill. And interestingly enough, Moore um, advertised for lots for sale in Capitol Hill in Caton's newspaper in 1901. And in 1903, he built his own family's mansion on the same street the Catons lived on. That little red house is supposed to indicate. So they're about two blocks away from each other um, on the exact same street. And this stretch of 14th Avenue uh, with this red line here that was north of the Caton Revels house, that stretch became popularly known as Millionaire's Row. And you can still see all the mansions on Millionaire's Row today. And in 1901, uh, the Capitol Hill streetcar ran up 15th Avenue. And I have this um, photo up here um, with the arrow. This is looking from the top of the Volunteer Park Tower, looking south. It's a different view. And the arrow points to where the Kate and Revels house is. And the red line here is to demarcate kind of where Millionaire's Row ended at Mercer. And you can also see um, here, sorry, I, I'm on the, on the right map. I need to simplify these maps. I just, I love them too much. On the right map, you can see the, um, where the Capitol Hill um, trolley line would go up and it was actually diverted to go down to avoid Millionaire's Row to kind of spare the millionaires the noise of the streetcar. So here's a photo of the Capitol Hill streetcar. In those days, the neighborhood, as I mentioned, was known as a streetcar suburb. So the Catons would have used this streetcar to commute to their office, which was in Pioneer Square at 3rd and James. And here is a picture from 1906 of 14th Avenue, looking this time north on Millionaire's Row. And you can see the Volunteer Park Water Tower it's the previous photo, we were, we were viewing it from there. And on the left here, you can see James A. Moore's mansion, still standing, you can still walk by it. And here on the right, you can see um, this house, which is called the Bordeaux House. And this was also recently nominated for landmark status, just like one month before we nominated the Kate and Revels House. And interestingly, you'll note that both of these houses, both James A. Moore and the Bordeaux house, houses are built in 1903. And if you remember, the Catons moved to Capitol Hill in 1902, which was one year before. So technically they were actually living on Capitol Hill before the founder of Capitol Hill moved in, all on the same street. And today, if you look at the road in front of the Caton Revels house, you walk up there, you can actually still see where the trolley tracks were and where they were forced to divert at Mercer. So if you do walk up there, just take a look at the ground. I've tried to, um, to kind of outline it here. And basically this, anything above there was Millionaire's Row. And then you can, you can see how the Caton house, the Caton Rebels house is below that. So I think, that, I think there's a fun walk in this somewhere that we'll have to do one day when we can all be in person. So um, here I have a timeline um, with the research help of a local architect named Marvin Anderson. Um, we think that this notice right here on the top left from February, 1902 is when the builder of the house, Albert Felmley purchased the lot where the Caton Revels house was built. And it was about three months later that a building permit we found um, was filed by Felmley on May 9th 1902 for lot 11 block 7 to erect a one to two story frame house. About five months later in September you see a newspaper announcement 
that mentions Felmley selling the new house to Susie R. Caton for 4,500. Two things that are interesting here. Number one, it sure, it, that, that's a short time to build a house. One, two, three, four, five months. I mean, we take a lot longer than that today. So I don't know how much we've, uh, we've advanced here. The second interesting note is um, that actually a surprising number of women participated in real estate transactions in Seattle. Um, and someone needs to research that a little bit more because it, it is quite fascinating. And Susie R. Caton was the first owner of the house, not, not her husband. And um, finally, on the lower right, we see the Catons officially moved to their new house on Capitol Hill the next month after they bought it. So that would have been in October. And this diagram kind of shows that all of this happened within the same year, from buying the plot of land, to building the house, to selling it, to the Catons moving in. The house itself is likely based on a pattern, so it's not architect designed. And here on the far left, you can actually see an example of a pattern. And pattern books were widely published in the early 1900s, and they were especially useful in places like the Puget Sound region, where there were still relatively few trained architects. And you can see how similar that pattern is to the house that's there in, in the center. Stylistically, the Kate and Revels house is an asymmetrical Queen Anne Victorian. And this style was dominant from about 1880 to 1910. So when the house was built in 1902, that would have been about the last decade of the Queen Anne's popularity. Uh, one of the main characteristics that make this a Queen Anne is the hipped roof with two slightly lower cross gables in an L-shaped plan with one dominant gable front facing and another side facing. And this form was very common for the Queen Anne. In fact, about half of all Queen Anne homes had this shape and you'll start noticing it. And now that I've pointed it out, but you'll, you'll see this pattern quite a bit with that hipped roof and the front facing gable and the side facing gable. On the right here is another example of a house that has a similar form with that hipped roof with two lower cross gables. And it just so happens to be the Martin Luther King Jr. birth home in Atlanta, Georgia. And obviously there are lots of differences here between the Kate and Revels house, the pattern on the left and the MLK house on the right. But I generally wanted you to see this typical Queen Anne form with the hipped roof and cross gables and also how it was widely applied all across the United States. So here are two photos of the Kate and Revels house. Um, one is before 1905 and the other one is from 1909. Uh, another characteristic of the Queen Anne style is what's known as a pedimented or enclosed gable, which I pointed out here in that triangle. And you'll also notice it kind of seems that the gables are overhanging the second floor. That's another characteristic of the Queen Anne. Um, you'll also see that the gable is clad with wood shingles. And there's also this little half moon window. Uh, and there are these frieze cornices and moldings. Again, these are all characteristics of a typical Queen Anne home. Another thing you might notice is that when the house was first built, it had a smaller porch, uh, as you'll notice here, and, uh, and a little separate side porch that led to the dining room. And the front por porch was kind of flanked by these simple turned cylindrical posts. And in 1907, the Catons actually modified their home. They remodeled, if you will. And they expanded their porch to what you see today, and you can see it in the 1909 photo. And what you see today is this two-story wraparound variation of a porch that extends along the side of the house. And what's interesting for us is that this kind of modification in Queen Anne homes is found in only 5% of Queen Anne homes. And most commonly, this modification is implemented on the Gulf Coast in the south of the United States. So that makes this house being in Seattle, somewhat distinctive for the Pacific Northwest region. You probably won't see a ton of Queen Anne houses with this kind of double-decker wraparound porch. 
And this type of contour sawn porch posts and balustrades, you'll see they're slightly different. Um, these are also very common for the folk style of Victorian rather than the classic style. So I won't go into detail about all the architectural details of the house, but I did wanna point out the cottage windows. Um, this is another typical Queen Anne element and the cottage window is a window with a large lower sash and a decorative upper transom that might be showcasing either colored glass or cut glass designs. And this picture below it shows one of the windows of the Kate and Revels house where you can see a bevel cut diamond design in the upper lights and you can actually see this exact same design in the earlier photograph I showed of the family. It's the exact same window. So obviously there are so many other details about the house that I won't have time to go over today, but they're all in the proposal. I understand the link has been shared. If you get interested, you can read the proposal, definitely look at the appendix in there. Um, if you're interested in this at all, I, I think you'll, you'll like the proposal. But these are just a few of the other highlights that I'll include. Uh, one is a doorknob detail, an ionic wooden column that flanks the interior parlor fireplace. And you can also see the green terracotta tile surround. Um, you can also see this built-in china cabinet in the dining room. And here you can see below the details from this built-in kitchen cabinet, and it still has its full-out flower bin and an ice box cabinet with holes to the outside porch to keep the food cold. And all of this is still in the house. It really is a time capsule. And no one has painted over, you know, this beautiful um, built-in china cabinet or any of the fireplace. It, it's really remarkable how well it has been preserved and kept. Going back to the story a little bit. Um, in the time that Catons lived on Capitol Hill, the Black American population in Seattle surged as more Black Americans were fleeing the South. So during this same time, uh, time of population growth, um, racial tensions began to intensify. So you see here in 1890, there were only 286 Black Americans in Seattle versus a population of about you know, 43,000. In 1900, which is um, Two years before the Catons moved up to Capitol Hill, there were 406 Black Americans, still less than 1% of the entire population. But by 1910, you see this big surge. Um, well, it seems like a big surge at the time, but um, it's 2,296 uh, Black Americans. And within that short time span of 10 years, that feels like a lot. And of the entire population, Black Americans become 1% of the entire population. So this was a period of increasing racial tension in Seattle. This is um, when uh, in 1909, a local real estate agent named Daniel Jones sued the Catons for quote unquote, greatly depreciating the value of the property. Um, and Horace Caton, incidentally, he was not shy he went to court on this and he won the lawsuit actually. And he wrote a scathing editorial in his a newspaper, the Seattle Republican about Dan Jones. And here's his quote. He says, the black man of this country is as much a citizen of the United States as is Dan Jones himself. And our constitution does not prohibit citizens from living wherever he or she is able to buy property just so long as he or she conforms to the general regulations. The black man too, it must be remembered, has some feelings as to his neighbors, the same as the white man. And we suspect the most of them would strenuously object to having either Dan Jones or any white man of his stripe as their neighbors. <laughs> and he says some other things that I decided not to put here, but a little Easter egg is if you'd like to go look up that article, I put the date here and I'm happy to share um, a copy of this presentation with you all after this. And you can go look up the rest of what he wrote there. But all I will say was he had, uh, he, was, he was beyond his times. He was modern for his times. Even the way he wrote was quite contemporary. So even though Caton won that lawsuit, it was clear that times had changed. Um, unfortunately, advertisements and subscriptions for the newspaper fell rapidly. 
And after the Catons published a story about a lynching that happened in the South on the front page of the newspaper, things got worse. Um, Horace Caton lost his seat at the Republican State Central Committee and facing financial hardships due to increasing discrimination uh, regarding advertising in his newspaper and uh, subscriptions, all of it just kind of busted, the Catons were forced to move out of their house and they began renting it in 1909. They moved to an apartment building that they owned in the Central District and they sold their Capitol Hill home in 1912. They tried to hold on to the newspaper as long as they possibly could, but they were forced to shut it down in 1913. The oldest Caton son, Horace Jr., wrote an autobiography published in 1964 uh, called Long Old Road. Uh, great, great book if you want to read it. He remembers his father sitting down and telling him why they had to move and why they had to shut down their newspaper. And I will read that quote. Oh, here, but first, this is the advertisement they had in their newspaper uh, for their house. And here's a quote. Things are changing here in Seattle and not for the better. I can remember when it didn't matter what color you were. You could go any place and work most any place, but it's different now. Now the South has overtaken us and freedom is only in name, not in fact. I'm defeated. I have given up any hope of ultimate freedom for myself. It may not even come for you children, but for this, I want you to fight all your life. America may not offer much, but it is the only country we have or ever will have. Here's a photo of Horace and Susie Caton. They never stopped believing in the struggle for equality. This photo was taken in 1935 along uh, Lake Washington. They love to take walks. Along with others, Horace founded the Seattle chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, in 1913. And it was um, one of the first, if not the first chapter west of the Mississippi. In 1917, Caton sued Epler Cafe in downtown Seattle because they refused to serve him anymore. They used to serve him, but they stopped. And so he took them to court. And in 1924, he staged a lone one-man sit-in at the segregated Strand Theater in downtown Seattle. And to give you context, this was 36 years before the 1960 sit-in movement in Greensboro, North Carolina. And in fact, I did a little more research and I found out that the first stage sit-in to occur in the United States is popularly believed to have occurred in 1939 in the South. So the fact that Caton staged a sit-in more than 10 years earlier in the Pacific Northwest is noteworthy. Horace Caton passed away in 1940, and this was eight years before uh, racially restricted covenants uh, ended. So Susie passed away three years later, and both their ashes are spread in the Puget Sound. Their children would go on to become leaders in their own right. So this picture um, is of their second eldest daughter, Madge. She became one of the first females to graduate from the UW Business School. Revels Caton was a leader in the labor and civil rights movement. And he and his best friend, the singer, Paul Robeson, were apparently one of the first to coin the term black power. And Horace Caton Jr., who is in the center of this photo here, was a prominent socialist who was part of a circle of black intellectuals, including the novelist Richard Wright and the poet Langston Hughes and the playwright Sinclair Lewis. And today the Seattle Republican is now one of the major sources of documentation of black American life in Seattle for that period. The Caton Revels House symbolized a missing piece of Seattle history and of Pacific Northwest black American heritage. When I came upon it, I was shocked that it wasn't landmark yet. And I was born and raised in Seattle. So I was shocked I hadn't learned about it in school. I was embarrassed not to know the story. And uh, I kind of, I felt like it was our civic duty to, to get this house recognized. Um, Horace Caton famously always believed that the historic role of black Americans was inextricably bound with the destiny of the nation. 
So um, it is with honor that I get to say that just a few months ago, the city voted unanimously to landmark it. The designation meeting happened in April and it was a pretty remarkable event. It was attended by one of the Caton Revels descendants. And out of the six criteria that the Landmark Preservation Board looks at, um, only, only one criteria has to be met to become a landmark, but the board voted that the house met at least four of those criteria. And those are that it is a location and associated in a significant way with a historic event with a significant effect upon the community, city, state, or nation. It's also associated in a significant way with the life of a person important in the history of the city, state, or nation. It is associated in a significant way with a significant aspect of the cultural, political, or economic heritage of the community, city, state, or nation. And they also threw in, it embodies the distinctive visible characteristics of an architectural style or period or a method of construction. One of the Caton Revels descendants that I mentioned, Harold Whitson Jr. was also able to join us and say a few words. And this is a photo of him standing on that same porch, which is why I put the photo right there. Um, and he visited Seattle in 2013. This is Harold's mother, Susan Caton Woodson. She was the granddaughter of Horace and Susie Caton, but they actually raised her as their own daughter. Um, they adopted her after their eldest daughter, Ruth, passed away very young. And in this photo, she's standing next to the mantle clock that the president of the Confederacy gave to her great grandfather, Hiram Revels, as a gift for stepping up to take his spot on the US Senate. Again, you can't make that up. Uh, Harold still has this clock and we wanna bring it back to the house where it used to be on the mantle. Susan was the family's archivist and her son Harold brought her ashes to Seattle and scattered them at the Kate and Revels house. So it was particularly special to have him there virtually of course at the landmark designation. And before I end, I just wanted to quickly acknowledge that there is so much more I don't have time to share, but if I piqued your curiosity, I encourage you to read the entire proposal, as I mentioned, or to pick up any of these amazing books. Uh, one is The Hill with a Future, which was about Capitol Hill in general. And this was the first book that I, had, um, that I, that I saw had the address of the house in it, which led me to walk by it. Um, and then I uh, picked up The Kate and Legacy by Richard S. Hobbs. You can pick that up and it is a gripping, gripping book. You've got to read this if you're at all interested in this story. Um, and then um, there are two kind of landmark books about Black American history in Seattle. One is Seattle's Black Victorians by Esther Hall Mumford, as well as The Forging of a Black Community by Quintard Taylor. Unfortunately, um, Seattle's Black Victorians is no longer in print, but the Seattle Public Library has copies that you can reserve. It's because of the research of these historians uh, that we, they've kept the Caton story alive. So I just wanna be clear that I didn't just, you know, uh, stumble upon this. I stand on the shoulders of giants here. They did the research um, and I just consolidated it and tripped upon this at the, at the right time. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. Again, thank you so much for inviting me and for taking the time to, to hear this. Um, it is definitely a story of the pandemic, I wanna say, because um, I, I would not have had the time to have gotten interested, to have dedicated uh, myself to this, to have connected with people. So um, it's one, one small silver lining. Thank you again. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that is fantastic. Oh, thank you. That is so sweet. <laughs> well, I mean, you have you have sh shown a light on the fact that you know uh, black prejudice, prejudice against blacks, and discrimination didn't just start in the Civil War era nope. and the nope. Reconstruction era. We made it here ourselves here in Seattle. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I failed to question. mention that the housing discrimination laws were put in uh, in effect in 1927, I believe it was. So after the Catons had even moved out of their house, and then they ended in 1948. Yeah. 
Was that painting on the book on the right? Was that a Jacob Lawrence by any chance? It's, bingo, it's, bingo, okay. yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> Be beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for hearing it. Thank you, Peter. Other questions or comments that people want to make? Laura? You have to unmute yourself, Laura. I had a question. Yeah, Laura's going to do, and then Nancy, I'll call on you. Okay. Laura, Laura Weiss, and then if Laura. Well, I'm going to have Nancy go first, Laura, and then you unmute yourself. Laura, if Nancy, uh, Laura, if you're on a computer, it's in the lower left hand corner. You have to move your cursor to the bottom of your screen. It took me the longest time to figure out, too. <laughs> it really did. I got it. I, now. <laughs> okay. So, Laura, do you want to go ahead and then I'll have Nancy? Okay. I, I was just going to say that, that uh, housing discrimination in Seattle didn't end really until uh, 1968 with the uh, federal law because. Uh, Seattleites vote and voted down a fair housing initiative in 1964. Yep. And I, the 48 was the one that it was that do away with uh, covenants or what? It, it was federal. There could not, uh, it, it was a federal thing, but you were absolutely right that we did not pass anything until um, until 1968. It was after Martin Luther King yeah. Jr. Yeah, I, I know some people yeah. that had trouble getting houses in as late as the early 60s, so. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, okay, thank you. I, I, I had another one, but let me wait till somebody else gets a question. Nancy? Hi, I just wanted to ask uh, if any, you talked about the patterns of the, this is an architectural question, the patterns of the Queen Anne. What, are you familiar with the Sears houses, the patterns? I'm from the South and and there are a number of Sears pattern houses in the South, which reminded me of these. So. Absolutely. The pattern houses were so popular in Seattle, specifically the Sears pattern. I mean, they're they're iconic, right? And yeah, a good deal of our early house stock is actually patterns. It's a little known fact. We think every house is architect design. Not the case. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Oh, go ahead. Go, ahead. Everyone, I'll go another one. The uh, descendant of uh, the Catons who was there pictured on the porch. Could you say who he was again? And is, does he live in Seattle? His name is Harold Woodson Jr. And uh, incidentally, he will be joining me on another call this week, should you want to attend. We are doing a talk for Historic Seattle on uh, Thursday night, and I will share those details um, with Ginny after this, if, if you want to share those. I believe it's so free to attend. Doesn't, and he doesn't live here in Seattle. Right? He doesn't. He lives in North Cal California. And also on that Thursday event, the owners will also be joining us. So the owners of the house, Harold and myself, and we're going to talk about demystifying the landmarking process. Since we understand a lot of the barriers to landmarking or the cost of it. Of course, I did this for free. It was just like a citizen you know, duty type thing. So we're doing this talk to kind of help demystify the process and help people understand that anyone can nominate these houses. It doesn't have to be a professional architect. So I see that the link's been shared for that talk. Um, oh, in, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Ryan. Also, if anybody contacts me, I can send the link for that also. So, so I kind of, you have such um, a passion in, when you talk. It's, and it's, you've done such lovely research. And I'm curious, were you more interested in history or in architecture when you started doing this project? It's, a, it's an interesting question. So, um, I thought about it a little bit. Um, my family was actually one of the first non-white families to live in a neighborhood in North Seattle called Windermere. So I think that I was maybe sensitive also to, to these types of stories and maybe that's why it touched me, I don't know. And it was also during the pandemic. And my dear friend, Ryan, who has joined this webcast also, we went to college together and he was um, doing research on his family who moved up to, um, to work in Roslyn as miners, they came up from the South. And during all this time, we had this free time. And I was just, if you read the Caton legacy, you, you will cry reading it. It is an amazing story. And 
just with all the reckoning we've had in the past two years, it's just, it felt like a time where history had compressed itself and there, there was um, a necessary urgency. I, it, it was a weird time, Ryan is my witness, but, uh, but we, it, it, I felt like I was kind of riding a wave, if you will. I, I'm not, it, I've never been interested in architecture, you know, it's like I'm, I'm kind of tertiarily interested in history. So what was I interested in doing? I, I don't know. I think I was just audacious and, um, and just, I wish I had a better answer. I have to think about it a little bit more. Literally, I, I, after I'd read the book and stuff and I'd walked by the house and I saw it wasn't landmarked, uh, I was walking by one day and I ran into the owner who was in the front, on the front lawn. And it was a funny coincidence, if you believe in coincidences, something about the water main that had worked since 1902 had broken that day. And so she happened to be there and I said, hi. And I said, do you know the history of this house? And that's how the conversation started. And right there on the front lawn, I said, would you be open to me writing the landmark proposal? I didn't know if I could do it or not. And that's how it all started. Wow. Very random. What does being landmarked do? What is, how does that affect the house in terms of, uh, I guess it can't be remodeled or it can't, I mean, what does it do in terms of the physical structure of the house? That is a great question. So um, once you get the board to agree that your house is, um, is, can be landmark, then you go through a process of controls where you start getting detailed about what parts of the house get preserved because not all parts of the house get preserved. In fact, the interiors are rarely preserved. It's usually an exterior that's preserved. And what that means is um, if, you, if you want to make some kind of um, modification, you have to reach out to the landmark board. And of course, our, our district's um, preservation officer is very approachable. We knew that it wasn't going to be this bureaucratic thing. Erin um, Doherty is amazing. And you email her and you say, you know, we want to change the roof. And she's like, okay, that, that looks great. You know, it's not like some crazy bureaucratic thing like some, some people think it is. In the case of the Kate and Revels house, um, the parts that were preserved ended up being the front facade, the side facades, um, and the back facade only from the second floor down. And they really, the owners wanted the interior, which is very unusual, but because the owners wanted it, the board was okay with it. They had the first floor interior, except for the kitchen and bathroom also preserved. And the hope is in, in preserving it, that it, um, that eventually one day, you know, there, there might be hope for sharing this story with others. Right now it's used as a triplex rental but the, um, the owners are thinking about what's next for the house. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Was any of this surprising to people? I don't know if, you've, uh, if, if you grew up in, in Seattle or not, but was this something that was known about or not? I, I was born and raised in Seattle and I was shocked I didn't know this story. And we, we had Washington State history and, and I was embarrassed not to know it. So I'm just curious, was it a story that was lost through time? Please. Yeah, Frank, unmute yourself and tell us some wisdom. Shoot. How do we unmute? same you know if, if it's a computer it, you have to move your cursor down to the very bottom of your screen and it's in the lower left corner can you hear me yes now we can hear you okay <laughs> i came to seattle in 1950 to go to university of washington and by accident i was in a bookstore and i picked up a book by harold case um, yes and it was a memoir writing about his time here in seattle and the newspaper and i remember reading it and was fascinated 
but I didn't do any more study with it. I thought your presentation tonight was very lively and stimulating. Thank you. Uh, as an African-American living in the university district, Capitol Hill and Broadway in the 50s was not a friendly place. Um, so do you have access to the markets that were located on what we know as Broadway, where QFC is currently? I remember these were little family owned vendors all along Broadway. And that if I went up there, I felt that I was out of place. Uh, so yeah, there's a historian at the University of Washington, uh, Quentin- uh, Quintart Taylor. Yes. And he's been at a Horizon House and he has talked about Seattle being a place of constant change. Yep. It really has been. Um, and I, since I've been in Seattle, uh, I've seen it. The, um, so it's a, I really enjoyed uh, the evening. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. And everyone should read that Quintard Taylor book. It is really something. And actually, let me grab the one that Frank, you just mentioned. It's called Long Old Road. Um, uh, let's see, here it is. It's by Horace Caton's youngest son, Horace Jr. This is the book. Yeah, I, I have to say that I yeah. did learn about that and learn about the book in uh, in a Northwest history class at the UW. You did? Yes, John. What Finley. year was that? Oh, now let me think. It was a while ago, probably. Wow. No, it wasn't John Finley. It was early. It was way back in 1970. Wow. Can you give the title again and the author? Huh? Oh, yeah. You know what? I will send I'll send a copy of all of this to Ginny and she'll she'll send it she'll send it out. Yeah, I I'm wrong. It was a later date. It was it was 1990 that I took another course in physics. The first one I don't think had it in, but yeah, and that and we had excerpts from the Long Old Road. So it was He talks great. about living in Capitol Hill, growing up in Capitol Hill in this book. And he talks about how he was one of the well, he he was one of the only black kids in the neighborhood at that time. And his mother gave him a piece of coal um, just in case anyone tried to hurt him when he went out Halloween trick or treating. And he said that in the end of the day, no one did anything to him. The Seattle way was just to ignore him. Mm -hmm. So that was Seattle's way. Mm -hmm. They didn't go trick or treating at any of the houses. They didn't feel welcome. If, if I could, I wanted to say too that Esther Mumford came here to speak. Uh, we were doing a neighborhoods uh, program on the central area. I think that was 2018 or so. And she talked about the history. So we got just, we did have a copy of the Black Victorians in the library here. I guess we should check and make sure that it's still You should check, it's worth something. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that um, when we look back on the um, our year and a half of COVID, we should say there are blessings. So it's such a blessing that you um, had such energy and time to find this information and that you're making the time to share it. I see, you know, I've been following you since I first heard you speak at, on several venues, and I'm glad that you're um, getting an opportunity to share this story. We have learned in this last two year, um, year and a half about um, the story of the indigenous people of this area. And we've learned um, so much about um, what's happened with um, uh, 
black people in this area. <coughs> partly spurred, of course, by news events, but um, we have we're old people and we have much to learn. And we're we're glad for this opportunity. And again, thank you for the blessing of your energy, your intelligence, and your curiosity. Thank you so much for being with us. Isabel. Thank you so much. I'm really humbled. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Appreciate it. Until next time. Yeah. Okay. Farewell. Like come again in person because she wants to move here eventually, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come Thank you all. I hope to see you in person. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>